The first HMS Ganges was anchored in St. Just Paul, opposite Mile or Dockyard. St. Just Paul itself is situated in Falmouth Harbour in Cornwall, where Ganges boys came ashore for sports and church services. My Lord at one time was the smallest naval dockyard in the world, and it was in this house that the dockyard superintendent lived. The house is privately owned, but still looks as imposing now as it did then 100 years ago. Adjacent to the house is the building now called the Ganges Restaurant. It was once the sick bay and hospital quarters for the Ganges crew, and the long room above was used as a mortuary where the bodies of boys, who mostly had fallen from the mast, were placed awaiting burial. The restaurant is also a mini museum of Ganges memorabilia. Many mementos of the ship adorn the dining room walls. The restaurant is an essential port of call for ex-Ganges boys who come here every Remembrance Sunday to lay a wreath at the memorial in the nearby Mylor churchyard where many Ganges crew are buried. The wording on the Ganges memorial states that it was erected by the boys from the ship in 1892. It stands in the secluded naval section of the churchyard and commemorates the names of boys who died on board, mainly whilst undergoing training for rigging the ship for sail. The memorial is maintained by a few local ex-Ganges boys who visit occasionally to lay flowers or wreaths. Later, the ship sailed around the coast to Harwich Harbour and Shotley where the boys found themselves in for a very rude awakening. There's a village they call Shotley to the east of Ipswich town, the port of Felix Stowe across the way. There's a concrete ship called Ganges near the Orwell flowing down and skirted by the shores of Harwich Bay. We joined as Nozzers new, kitted out in navy blue. We punched each other's teeth out in the gym. We march, we double fast and we climb that bloody mast. The foreign legion never was as grim. The ship HMS Ganges anchored here until 1905 and during that time the boys gradually established a relationship with the villagers the residents of Shotley. They came ashore first to play football and cricket, but home for the boys was a second-rate, three-masted, 84-gun warship built of teak in Bombay in 1821. It had several names before it was called Ganges. It was a ship like this that sailed into my boyhood dreams and its concrete counterpart was a crushing disappointment. The instructors here of 1898 looked very hard and very unbending. And fancy having to scrub those dirty duck suits every day. Talk about hard times. My first sight of Ganges was not so romantic. It was the Annex, a group of tin-roofed huts around a parade ground. This was the first bombshell which shattered a boyhood dream. Where is the warship waiting to take us to foreign ports? And who are these mafia types waiting to waylay us? The chief said we're going to the tonsorial artist to have our tonsorials painted. Oh dear, it's a barber. Just a quick beetle cut, if you please, my good man. We only do one style, sir. The Ganges special, short back and scalped all over. Then they gave us free clothing. They called it free clothing because it was three sizes too large. You'll grow into it, lad. That's as sure as your arm looks downwards. Take my word for it. And he was right. We had to chain stitch our names in 100 pieces of gear. In the meantime, they taught us to march. They didn't tell us all this in the attractive glossy brochures which romanced about sailing the seven seas. We can't wait to get over to the main establishment. Surely things can't get worse, or can they? Ten divisions, admirals all, parade ground Nelson Hall, and Benbow Lane tucked out of sight away. Well, this is Benbow Lane running parallel with the long covered way behind the messes on my left. Benbow Lane obviously housed the messes of Benbow Division, and somewhere around here was my old mess. But the mess number plates are missing. But I see by coincidence that number 33, my old mess, is just here. This was my first taste of HMS Ganges, the main establishment proper, 
after having come over from the Amex, spent six weeks there, joined in September 1947. We were kitted out there and we spent most of the six weeks marching. I think we climbed half of the mast, going through the devil's elbow and not over it. We'll come back to that later. And then we went and punched each other's teeth out in the gym. And finally, they brought us over here to the main establishment. My memories of this particular mess aren't very happy ones. We had two very, very strict instructors. They were fanatics for cleanliness. Uh, okay, it's okay up to a point, I suppose. But uh, apart from cleanliness, they were strict on other things as well. Uh, outside here, we used to have to fall in three deep when the cooks to the galley brought back the food, dished out the grub on the tables, on plates, of course, uh, in the mess deck. And while they were doing that, we were fell in, fell in in three deep outside here and we were not allowed to do anything, not even talk or move. But a friend of mine, Dave Bryant, from Hastings, I think, who ended up as a stoker anyway, uh, he used to have a crafty burn while the instructor was inside. But one day the instructor caught him, told him to go inside and put his tin mug, fill it with water, and he came out, made him nip the cigarette, he put the cigarette in his mouth, or he made him put the cigarette in his mouth, and chew it, have a drink of water, and he made him swallow the lot, fag end and all. It's hard to believe that the mess you have just seen, and what a mess it is now, looked anything like this. Most instructors were absolute fanatics about the appearance of the polished deck, and that's not too hard to understand. It seems that the polished deck was symbolic and a guide to the efficiency of the instructors. For eating purposes, we used the mess deck. The tables on the mess deck also served as a desk for writing letters or playing board games during recreation periods. The polished deck was also used for kit musters, as we shall see in another shot later on. This is the mess deck, left as it was about six or seven years ago when all the boys vacated Ganges for it to become the Eurosport Centre. It's quite big, as you can see. It used to hold anything up to about 60 boys with 30 beds either side. The majority of the mess was, the, was called the polished deck, which was just forward of where we're standing right now. And that polished deck, as I've just explained anyway, through a lot of hardship, uh, was highly prized and we were not allowed on this deck with hobnail boots on. The rest of the outhouses, the toilets or the heads as we used to call them, um, are just outside down these three steps. the long, long covered way. The long, long covered way holds many different memories for as many different people. It also houses most of the mess decks. There was Exmouth, Blake, Rodney and Grenville with Duncan at the bottom. Over a space of 70 years, divisions change locations and sometimes names I learned from research that Ganges once had only eight divisions. That was back in the 30s. In my time there were 10. In the late 40s, messes were given names as well as numbers. My old mess was known as Greyhound. The Long Covered Way was home to many dozens of thousands of boys over the years. So I think you have to admit it's one hell of a long, long covered way. <laughs> Thank you. 
About halfway down the long covered way, on the right, coming from the quarter deck, was the galley. And this is where we used to collect our food from uh, in the trays. The cooks, the cooks of the mess used to get this. They weren't actually cooks, of course. They were just boys designated as cooks to come and fetch the food to the mess decks. And the food consisted of things like um, train smash, which was uh, bacon and tomatoes, or bangers and red lead, which again was tomatoes and sausages. And I think probably the most highly ridiculed was the favoured, time-honoured kippers and porridge, a wonderful combination. And you can bet that any Saturday morning before Captain's Rounds, having got up about half an hour earlier and scrubbed out the mess deck, that we have to take out the tables and the benches and put them in the long covered way to enable us to scrub out the mess deck and allow it to dry for Saturday rounds, all on the whim of a captain who may decide not to do rounds after all. But the buffing up, scrubbing out and swabbing of the deck served to make the mess deck look in smart. At least it was better than cleaning boats on a wild and windswept foreshore in the winter. After rounds for Saturday dinner, we had sausages and mash flavoured with bluebell metal polish which did nothing to spoil our massive appetites. It must have been worse for the lads having to wear duck suits as well and having to get them cleaned again ready for kit musters which were held every other week. And having cleansed the mess decks, let's go and see where we cleansed our souls. Every Sunday morning after divisions, the boys would break up into their own religious denominations and would all be marched off to our respective churches. Mine was the Church of England because I didn't know any better. Um, I think the Church of England is over there somewhere but we'll find that in a moment. But this one I think is called the Roman Catholic Church of the Sacred Heart. Now, bearing in mind the dilapidation of the rest of this place, let's go and have a look and see if the Lord has taken care of his own and preserved it a little bit better perhaps. As you can see that this place doesn't lend itself to filming, not in a very favourable manner anyway. And if you'll forgive the funny punny, I might have guessed it was a Roman Catholic church because the place is full of holy water and it's not the sort of water that allows you to walk on it either. This is the Church of England Church of St. George and it certainly looks as if God favours the Church of England personnel rather than the Roman Catholics because this is in a better state of repair than any other of uh, the churches that we've been in so far. I mean, take for instance this door and the rest of the place is really beautifully preserved. Also, take a look at the woodwork just up here. was Jolly Jack swinging the lamp again. Now, every Sunday morning, as I've said, we came to church and we couldn't wait for it to be over because it heralded the end of our duties for Sunday. This would be about 12 o'clock midday. After that, we'd have our dinner, which invariably consisted of roast potatoes, roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, and a sweet after that. I forget what the sweet used to be. Then all we had to do was read the Sunday newspapers, go down on the sports field, or up and over the mast, play rugby, cricket, football, or whatever you did it, like to do, swimming, walk along the foreshore. There wasn't a great lot to do, really. Or rather, there was a great lot to do, but sometimes we never seemed to do. We used to sit around the old coke stove or the coal stove and just talk about what it would be like if we were back in Civvy Street. But the funny thing that struck me about these Sunday church services was they invariably used to sing one hymn at least. And that one hymn was, guess, you've got it, for those in peril on the sea.
On Sundays, when we had more time to ourselves, we would often reminisce about home. A lot of boys suffered with homesickness, and two boys in my mess kept us awake sometimes, sobbing after lights out. This hospitality house, built in 1916 at the top of Laundry Hill, was used by parents who were visiting their boys in Ganges or the hospital nearby. It was about the closest link with Sibby Street, that is, apart from Shotley Village, which hasn't changed much at all. Down the main street, just here, is the little shop still selling Players Number 10s and ice cream. There are some additional houses, but the village looks much the same as always. The pub still stands, perhaps a lot busier now with the tourist trade than it used to be. Our shore leave was restricted to three hours in Ipswich once every term, or two hours in Shotley on Sunday afternoons. One leave in Shotley was enough with so little to do there. And across the harbour, which is where the rivers Orwell and Stour meet, are the international ports of Felixstowe and Harwich. It's a popular place for tourists and fishermen now, with a view of the inevitable ferry, always at anchor. Passing through these portals back in the old days meant either leisure, pleasure or sheer hard work. This is the path to the gymnasium and also to the firing ranges. Ganges had three gyms and in there we vaulted, climbed ropes, exercised on the wall bars and boxed with each other in number three gym where I managed to become the bantamweight champion of Grenville Division. Well, this is the changing room in number one gym. Well, the changing steps, I suppose, really, because that's, after all, what they are, is steps, or a viewing balcony for anyone wanting to watch what's going on down below. Out there and down there in number one gym. And every ex-Ganges boy will remember Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Core, I needed that. The gym wasn't only used for gymnastics. Every year each boy had to fight all others of his own weight to determine who should box in the finals for the division. And here's one bumptious contender just waiting to have that silly grin knocked off his face. HMS Ganges also supplied display teams for gymnastic displays at other establishments. And on Sundays the gym was rigged for church and had a captive audience of about 2,000 religious reluctants. We would then re-soil our sinful souls reading scandal in the Sunday newspapers. We held our divisional dances here, which were attended by the local girls. It was also used as a cinema, and after tea on Saturdays, we'd arrange our mess deck benches in the gym to watch films of John Wayne or Errol Flynn performing the Shanghai Draw. This is the gunnery range where we were taught to shoot with a .303 rifle and pistol shooting with a Smith & Wesson .38 caliber for the communicators. This weapon is the SLR, the self-loading rifle in 7.62 caliber. Here, demonstrating this rifle, is the civilian counterpart of our chief GIs and pogies who chewed anchors and spat rivets but they knew their job even though it was painful at times for us to learn it. Shooting lessons most times were almost as good as recreation and many boys, including myself, spent leisure hours learning to kill the enemy with just one shot.
Well, would you believe it's a lady's toilet in the Siemens block. I've had a look inside and there is not one I was here before Kilroy written upon the wall. But, come with me. I forgot all about this actually, but first let me tell you that this is uh, one of the rooms in the Siemens ship line. Now, back in 1981, I was here with the Ganges Association, or it was a reunion actually, and I wrote on this board, John Douglas was here before Kilroy, 16th of May, 1981. This all came about, I wrote a book called HMS Ganges, Roll of My Dust, and I formed a reunion held on this day. And from that reunion was born the Ganges Association, which is now uh, about 1150 strong. There's nothing really left of this place. All the equipment has been taken out. Um, the only thing that is left uh, is these cartridge cases, which were left behind by some organisation which now uses the seamanship block as a killing ground. Age and decay in all around I see. The spick and span image of ship shape and Ganges fashion obviously no longer applies here. The walls are peeling, windows cracked and broken, and litter is everywhere. Deserted corridors which once echoed to the boots of boy seamen are now strewn with rubbish. Even the ceilings have shed flakes of paint upon the once polished decks. This isn't how it used to look in its heyday, and the poem, The Legend of Ganges, says, Clinkerbilt and Carvel, correct a starboard list, how to take evasive action from the bombs. To bend, to splice and hitch, how to knot a monkey's fist, and semaphore and flashing for the comms. Which gives us a natural link with the signal school just here, which is in much the same state as the seamanship block. Overlooking the foreshore in rather scenic surroundings is the place where bunting tossers and sparkers learn their semaphore flashing and typing. Just a couple of hundred yards away from the main establishment and we called it the old signal school. This is one of the classrooms in the signal school itself. As you can see, the blackboard has been taken down and now it's a green board on the wall. The ceiling's falling down and like the rest of poor old HMS Ganges, that's going to be knocked down as well. In these rooms we learn all oh, flag codes, morse codes, um, semaphore, typing even. As a matter of fact, this may have been one of the typing uh, classrooms. I'm not too sure because there's uh, all the equipment that has been taken out. But it was here that we learned how to trade and they learned as well because the, I think the um, curriculum for the WT, the communication ratings, was something like about 15 months as opposed to the Siemens or the Dabto as we call them, theirs was a mere nine months. So obviously the communicator had much more to learn. But there's one thing that we have learned, I suppose, and that is that nothing lasts forever, and you won't be long now before all this has gone forever. Whether we were sparkers or buntings, we learned to receive the Morse code and how to send it up to 26 words a minute. It was similar for the VS branch as well. Also, semaphore, which was obviously difficult at first, especially reading it. There was typing also, we had to pass out at 30 words a minute and also learn to use the teleprinter and later learn to use an oldest lamp in Nozzer's Lane. This is Nozzer's Lane where the old annex used to be 
and where the signal boys felt they needed all they could get of faith, hope and charity. But there was faith and there was hope, there was charity as well. But these were not just virtues, as you know. They were flights of concrete steps where instructors gave us hell. Our souls were signed to Ganges, be it so. What faith, what hope, what charity, there can be no comparity. Stumbling up those steps with muscle pain. We knew we'd had enough, but pretended we were tough, so they made us double up and down well, again. Well, that was faith, hope and charity. The famous, or rather infamous, steps well known to boys under punishment and for any boys coming home from the signal school or from boat training from across the way there if they'd been naughty lads. Uh, they call them faith, hope and charity because you had faith that you were going to make it to the top when you was at the bottom. When you was in the middle you began to realise that you needed hope and by the time you got halfway up this lot you began to realise that you also needed charity. But still, 40 years on, it's not bad for an old one is it? But I think I'm getting a few palpitations here, I'd better nip off to the sick bay. And perhaps that's not such a bad idea after all. The hospital overlooks the peaceful, tranquil foreshore that skirts the harbour, looking over to Harwich and Felixstowe across the estuary. For some boys this was the path to freedom. When I was researching the book HMS Ganges Roll on My Dozen, I received a letter from an ex-sick bay tiffy who said he was amazed at some of the self-inflicted wounds which the boys performed upon themselves in an attempt to either get a few days in sick bay or to work their ticket, their freedom from Ganges. One boy I know actually worked his freedom but he had to do so many days jankers and receive so many vicious cuts that I often wonder if he thought it was worth the effort. But life was rough and tough for some. A boy in the next bed to me committed suicide whilst on summer leave and an oppo of mine slashed his wrist just to get out of a kit muster. I heard of boys piercing their eardrums with needles. Ganges Hospital was the finest on the east coast and it didn't only cater for boys. Men from ships anchored in the harbour were also brought here. Ganges Hospital also had a morgue which was where they laid the body of one unfortunate Laundry Hill victim who died doing jankers on Laundry Hill. Rifles chafing collarbones, the hot sun scorching down, from inverted bowl of blue, the cloudless sky. Up Laundry Hill on jankers, tin hat shaded sweated frown, and bayonet banging hard against the thigh. It was, don't you do as I do, make do with what you've got. Obey the orders blind, no ifs or buts. Ganges' discipline was hot and some went on the trot, but they dragged them back and lashed them with twelve cuts. Well, it's okay doing it once in rainy weather, but try doing that for a solid hour in the height of summer with the sun blazing down and you're wearing a full uniform, gaiters, boots, belt, 18-inch bayonet and a 303 rifle. Doubling up and down, laundry hill, for a solid hour, non-stop. Yes, OK, I know that sometime later that they stopped them doing this and that they doubled for 10 minutes and then had a one-minute rest. Ha <laughs> ha, big deal. And that they took away the 303 rifle and gave them a stick instead. But that was after a boy had actually collapsed and died while doing jankers on the famous Laundry Hill. Albeit that at the same time there were a crowd of boys in the laundry, like as not as they always did, having a good laugh while they were doing their dobian. This is where we used to do the bulk of our dobian or washing. And I'm pretty sure that if I'd have turned out something like this at the end of it, it would have hurt me kit musters every day for the next 12 months. This is the actual place where the original spin drive used to stand. Some of the wash basins are still intact, as you can see but most of them have been taken away and the rest of the place unfortunately like the rest of HMS Ganges as it used to be is falling into dilapidation and decay. On the right is the mechanical washing machine but I was never lucky enough to use it and the Capo di Monte type figure lounging about upon it was a civilian worker probably an ex Royal Marine. We had to get down on hands and knees and scrub away the grime from our clothes with a scrubber and pusser's hard soap. 
The instructor would then make an inspection and if there was just one small dirty spot, we had to do it all over again. Then hang the washing up to dry in the drying room at the end of the mess decks. Dobian was boring. Personally, I would much rather have spent the time sitting up the mast on the half moon where I spent many a happy make and mend. The mast is HMS Ganges. Neither is complete without the other, but soon one of them is destined to lose a lifelong friend. The mast is nearly 150 feet tall and part of it originally belonged to HMS Cordelia, brought ashore and erected in 1907. It has claimed the life of at least one victim in the years 1938 to 39. We were introduced to the mast and the devil's elbow during our Nozzer days in the uh, annex. That was only pretend, of course. The, uh, all the shrouds are missing. They've uh, rotted away and fell away, and now there's nothing left of them. They are trying to preserve the old girl, I think, for posterity. But during my day here, and I think most other boys' uh, days, what we had to do every so often, we were known as mast class. Each mess had its turn, and the fastest were front of the queue, of course, and we had to put our foot on the lower shroud and at the word go we'd clamber up and over the mast using the shrouds as a scrambling net. It was only when we were in the annex that we were allowed to go through the devil's elbow. At other times we had to climb over it. For some it was quite a terrifying um, experience because at one point we were suspended nearly 100 feet above the parade ground. From the first platform the view across the harbour was magnificent. And on Make and Mend Day, some of us spent our time on the mast working our way to the half moon above the first platform. I remember once climbing the Jacob's Ladder, which you can see just there, standing on the cross trees, then shinning up the rest of the mast to touch the button, which is 18 inches in diameter, but never looked big enough to stand on. But some were braver, and to be chosen as button boy for any big parade or ceremony, it was indeed an honour for which they were rewarded with enough money to buy four cigarettes. Adjacent to the mast was the quarter deck and the wardroom, which housed most of the officers. The captain and commander lived somewhere ashore, if Chalman Distant or Pinmill could be called ashore. At the moment, this building is called Ganges and is where myself and my camera crew were staying to make this film. Within months of making this documentary, the wardroom was used to accommodate police officers when Ganges became a police training college. The first thing I noticed when going inside this place was how well the polished deck looked, and I should know because I used to polish it when on jankers on a Saturday evening when my messmates and everyone else was at the gymnasium cinema. Apart from that, the wardroom and its surrounding area was out of bounds to boys whose mess decks were just around the corner opposite the regulating office. The quarter deck was hallowed ground. 
and it is where the boys under punishment mustered at the top of the long covered way and the skates and the schemers on commander's report fell in. We had to double across or be immediately slapped in the rattle which could be very painful sometimes. And Dublin was even more strenuous than marching on the parade ground over by the chiefs and POs messes. Salute the quarter deck, double across it and always say good morning to the chief. Every morning at 8.30 we fell in on the parade ground for morning divisions. After divisions we marched off to school or classes for seamanship or communications to our own divisional tune played by the Royal Marine Band. On Sundays, a more elaborate affair, we marched past the rostrum to our divisional tune on the way to church. If it was raining, the divisions were held in Nelson Hall. This building, Nelson Hall, would hold all the ten divisions of boys, about 2,000 of them, plus the officers and marine band. It had many figureheads like this one of St. Vincent. There were several of these in days gone by, and many ships were represented here. I wonder where they all are now. But the once busy Nelson Hall is now deserted and quiet. The bust you see here is the Ganges figurehead. The ship was built in 1821 and in the early 1900s was towed to Plymouth to be broken up. But this figurehead stood beneath the mast until 1976. But no one seems to know of its location now. Nelson Hall was also a museum and showcase for the hundreds of framed photographs of winning cricket, football and rugby teams which adorned its walls. Ganges was bought by Eurosports, but before that this old film shows the playing fields are being used for the purpose for which they were laid. A few years after this film was made, Eurosports sold out to private development and is currently used by the police who took over part of Ganges as a training college. In Ganges' heyday, divisions pitted their sporting skills against each other. These shots are of women's football teams vying for the honours sought after by Ganges' boys. And judo teams from all over Europe come along to knock seven bells out of their oppos on the one-time cricket pitch. Dominating the background is the dining hall built in 1950. I could have tolerated Ganges much better with this luxury canteen messing rather than having to eat frozen train smash of tin plates in the long covered way on a Saturday morning prior to captain's rounds. The food at Ganges wasn't too bad, but oh how we longed for payday in Nelson Hall every Wednesday so we could squander our hard-earned pittance on a gopher and ice cream at Stand Easy. A packet of fags, a dozen jam tarts and it was a long wait until next payday. Adjacent to the canteen were the punishment quarters where offenders received up to 12 strokes of a bamboo cane. This is one of the regulating petty officers who, it is claimed, delivered them. He was once known as Mr Hong Kong, but Ganges probably dubbed him as Creeping Jesus or the Shotley Shadow. And this is where the guard room used to stand before it was knocked down, right next to the main gate. Seldom did we see Ganges from this angle, because we were rarely let out, that is, except for shotly leave or returning reluctantly from main leave. But during its time as a boys' training establishment, the entrance was a very impressing and imposing sight to behold. These figureheads and cannons and ornamental gates guarded the entrance for several decades before being taken away forever, but they certainly bring back a lot of nostalgic memories. To the right is School Lane, which led to the school where we learned subjects not taught in our previous schooling. We marched out of the main gate to the school block along the road. And a session with the gentle boy schoolies was in contrast to the harshness of a loud voiced instructor. By the right, dress, move boy, move! We were men, not boys, so at first, most of us hated going back to school. After all, we'd left at 14 and been working for nearly two years before joining the Navy, so why the hell did we have to go back to school when we knew it all? But later, we began to enjoy it. The schoolies, the teachers, were usually quietly spoken, a contrast to the chief GIs who, by the sound of them, gargled with gravel every morning. The schoolies were kinder too. 
We learned subjects like navigation and electrics. We also had film shows which told us how to block up gaping holes in the bows with our hammocks. It put me off going to sea for a while, I can tell you. Yes, we liked school. It was much easier than, say, boat party on the foreshore. It wasn't that we disliked the boats. What we did dislike was the unnecessary cleaning of them on cold winter mornings. I mean, after all, boats don't actually get dirty, do they, being in water? On the day of the annual regatta, it was different. There was a carnival atmosphere. Lowering the boats, the high excitement, each division trying to be the best. Many a hard morning's row before breakfast was experienced by the boat crews, and the instructors were just as keen for their division to win as well. The boats were rowed out to the MFV to be towed in line ahead to the starting point. This was the anticipation of the excitement to come. The competitive factor was running high. Each boy would be shouting for his divisional boat to win. And then, when the race began, and so did the excitement. Each boy in each boat pulling until his heart felt as if it would burst, pulling as a team to win for their division. Muscular arms straining at the oars as if their life depended upon winning as one day perhaps it might. And then, as the winning crew passed the finishing line, the cannon would signal the end of the race. But victory can have its repercussions. Without warning, the coxswain of the winning boat is tipped overboard, but it didn't dampen the thrill of winning. In fact, he not only expected it, but probably enjoyed it. There was plenty of sailing to be had too. One of my own highlights of Ganges was sailing to Pinmill for a camping weekend. The foreshore contained a link of nostalgia. The MFV, which uh, towed the cutters, also served as a mail boat, taking our letters which we posted in the mailbox in the short covered way. And here in the short covered way was Drake Division. Benbow Lane to the left and the long covered way to the right. Somewhere here was the barber's shop. We had our hair cut, not voluntarily, I hasten to add, about every two weeks. Our hair had to be cut to within two inches of our eyebrows according to King's regulations and Admiralty instructions. These days, I only wish I could grow it to within two inches of my eyebrows. At the end of the short covered way was the mail office. One boy fell from the mast and bounced off its roof. Luckily, he lived. This is where we posted our letters, probably when we were on our way across the parade ground to the swimming pool. The pool was locked on the day this was filmed and we were told that the bulldozers would move in the following day. The pool is still there several years later. A boys training establishment would not be complete without a swimming pool. Whoever heard of a sailor who couldn't swim? Here's one boy with a special training harness. Non-swimmers had special classes, but after several weeks, if they failed, they were thrown in at the deep end. One boy drowned when I was there in 47. Swimming was very popular, especially the aquatic races between divisions, and winning points at aquatic sports was as important as winning divisional points on the lower sports field. Back again on the foreshore, and this time it's the sports field, where HMS Ganges held their annual sports, with all the messes competing with each other, and all the divisions competing with each other. This is the running track, and they held, in the middle of the field, they held the field events like javelin throwing, discus, putting the shot, and so on. The track is now overgrown with grass and weeds, not having been used for several years. But on sports days, we were all given the day off to cheer our teams, but not always to victory, unfortunately. Still, it was the feeling of having taken part. The boys competed division against division in events such as javelin throwing, discus, running and the long jump. And it was the only time anyone ever volunteered for the dreaded high jump. But it was all worthwhile when some visiting admiral's wife awarded the prizes. But the prize most of us cherished was the issue of a draftchet to a seagoing ship. And it was here on the foreshore that I came on my last day at Ganges before my final draft. I was going to forget the bad times and remember only the good, but even on that last evening before freedom, I never guessed I would ever return to ghastly Ganges, but I did, and so did many others. I organised a reunion of Ganges old boys, and here I am dishing out the rum, and the Ganges Association was formed from this reunion. 
we were all delighted to meet old messmates and shipmates. Big Humphreys, the human torpedo. The old boys, instructors and boys who had made it to the wardroom came to be photographed in their old messes. Or maybe take another look at the lung cupboard way, which looked like this, but has now been reduced to a pile of broken bricks and rubble to be used as a foundation for private houses. The old Ganges used to look like this in our day and for some time after. Then it was commercialised and it became Eurosports Village. After that and currently it is a police training college where police recruits still use the parade ground. And soon it will finally become a home for the aged rich and a millionaire's marina. What will happen to the Ganges Association when Ganges is gone? I spoke to the Ganges membership secretary about it. Mac Brody, you are the Ganges Association Membership Secretary. I am indeed. Can you tell us please how the Ganges Association was formed and what are you going to do when Ganges is finally pulled down? Certainly. The association was originally formed when John Douglas wrote a book called HMS Ganges, Roll on My Dozen. And a number of people then wrote and expressed a keenness for a reunion. And it was discovered that the, the, the Ganges itself was being redeveloped and the owners then would be delighted to have us. So we've, we formed the association. We are now over 1,150 strong with squadrons all over the world. And we have our reunions up till now here every year in May, but sadly it is now being closed. So we will have to find other venues for the reunions, whether it's in Birmingham in the Nautical Club or in a holiday camp somewhere around the country, we really don't know. Sadly, because it is now closing on the 3rd of November, HMS Ganges will see its last sunset. Wisdom, it is strength, Ganges' motto states at length, is there one of us who wouldn't go again? Though you flogged us and you flayed us by the living God that made us, you took us on as boys and made us men. And to the left of that building on the right is a mound of broken bricks which is all that remains of the messes. 
and awaits its final fate like that of the seamanship block. Hardcore for houses and bungalows. I wonder if the developers are aware that they were demolishing a legend. The infamous Laundry Hill is not too difficult to recognise, but not with affection. It claimed the life of one boy and was the despair of those on Jankers or Shopley routine. And you will have to look carefully for the laundry building now reduced to a small pile of bricks to the left of the hospitality house. On the foreshore, the water tower overlooks a sunken lower sports field, now a marina for expensive yachts, whose owners actually enjoy getting frostbitten on wild, wet and wintry Saturday mornings as the ghosts of Ganges cheer their teams to victory over a sports field which lies beneath the waters. Is nothing sacred? Well, yes there is, the mast. It will always stand as a protected monument a tribute to its past and the Ganges Association of Old Boys contribute to its maintenance to ensure it will be preserved to remind us of HMS Ganges and the times we may wish to recall of an important milestone of our past. Some broken slates and rubble too. Pieces of a place we knew. But to show its passing and its grave, a pile of bricks is all we have to remind us. Navy's youngest sailors indeed. For this is HMS Ganges, where about 1,800 boys first learn what it takes to become a fully-fledged member of the senior service under the motto, Fear God, Honor the King. And this is where they learn. This shore establishment, after four previous HMS Ganges, or wooden men of war, we've now come ashore. And this one is at the junction of the river Stour and Orwell in Suffolk, with Harwich on one side of the estuary and Felixstowe on the other. Well, I think it's about time we met one of these young metalers face to face. And so here's young Paul Bellringer, who's a junior radio operator, isn't it, Paul? Yes, that's right, sir. Aged? Sixteen and a half. And where do you live? Um, in Cheltenham, Gloucestershire. West Countryman? Yes. Now, it's uh, about this rig you've got on. This is a working rig, isn't it? You've got lots of rigs. Yes, you? there's there's quite a few rigs. And this, as you say, this is the working rig. Called so one, number called what? Called number, number eight. So you've got seven others? Yes, you might as well say that. we got various rigs for different different activities and all that sort of thing. And life's made easy if you're on instructors, I see, because your name is on your breast pocket there. It might be made easy for the instructors, sir, but it isn't easy for us when we have to throw <laughs> our names in. Oh, right, I see. Right, well, since we're on the riverfront, Paul, I suggest we start here by having a look at some of the many elements that go up to make this ancient art of seamanship. Now, what have we got here on the foreshore? Well, I think the first thing is this um, dry line cutter. You can see some juniors here, they're rigging it. Yes. Um, when you first come to Ganges, before you go out on the river sailing and pulling, you have to know what you're doing, and so you don't uh, get into any trouble. Uh -huh. So that's why they're 
they're taught on the um, shore here on the dry land, mm -hmm. these dry land craft. That's the instructor there on yes, the right. Yes, right? that, that's the instructor who, who tells them it all and after a while they get um, quite efficient at it and then they, they can take the there. boat out, they can take the boat out on their own. But unfortunately we shan't be seeing this afternoon because there isn't really quite enough wind. No, uh, uh, but usually there is quite a bit of wind around this district yes. but this afternoon it seems to have come. Now we've moved across to what? What's this? Um, these are a pair of shear legs. Mm -hmm. They're not used so much in the Navy now, but um, they're moved, uh, they're used for making... And they presumably move. teach you how to use spars and knots and lashings. Yes, and that, that that's all, um, the yes. finer cr um, seamanship. Gracious me, is this real or practice? No, this is uh, just a practice. They sometimes do this so that um, if it ever happens while uh, they're at sea, they'll know what to do. Man overboard, away life first crew. That sounds dramatic enough. Now what's happening? Um, well, there's just been a man overboard as a practice, and so all the boys are, that are near the boat are running down the pier. Well, the nearest ones The to nearest hand. ones to, to, to the lifeboat run to it. They're way down the jetty. Right round the corner. Here they come, thudding past us now. And uh, they've all got a specific job to do when they get there. They all know what to do. That's one of the first things we are taught when we come to Ganges, so we know what to do in case there is an emergency while we're on board ship. You see, this is all our, all train, all our training for when we do come on board ship. See, see the boat here. There's a, a boy already got in the boat. There's another one just climbing up the Jacob's ladder. There's a crew of five plus one coxswain. Yes. You can see him putting on the life jackets there. Now those davits are swung out in the ordinary yeah, way. Yeah, in the ordinary way they're, they're swung in. Oh. And it, I believe it from uh, a classroom at the top of the hill back there, it only takes about four minutes from the classroom to swing the davits up and to get the boat in the water. That's remarkable. Well, the others, meantime, are standing by on the falls. Uh, yes, they're, the uh, yes, that's right. They're called the boat falls. You can see them okay. taking the turns off ready for lowering. Yes. That's lowering. That's, um, there's quite a few boys on there because the, the lives of those six boys depend on what they do. You see, they check that line out very slowly. Now, normally, or in some cases, this boat might be let down from a ship. Might it not? Yes, and the ship will be underway at the time. They're checking away now, and you can see the the crew holding on to lifelines in case the boat suddenly went away under them. They'd still have something to hold on to. Then it's the boat's ready to slip. They'll be slipped in a minute from a disengaging gear when somebody pulls a lever. Yes. And so the boat will drop into the water. This is because if a ship was moving and the boat was allowed to dangle in the water, it would be crushed against the ship's side. And there it happened. It's just slipped. Now you see the crew quickly get out the the oars and cast off from the side of the jetty to rescue the man in the water. Right, rig up. And they're making their way as fast as they can to the yes. chapel fell in the, in the drink. One happy man overboard who's been collected and put back in the dry again. Oh, Paul, we seem to have a visitor. What's this coming alongside? Uh, this happens to be one of the three MSVs that be belong to HMS Ganges. Right over! Right over. Couldn't have told you. I think he means me. I'm about nearest. I'll have a try. You hold that. I'm no expert, but we'll just have a try. I think that's very good. Expert, please. That's just how it should be done, presumably. Yeah. All the way, every bit of 25 yards, I think. Yes, sir. Well, now, tell me more about these things. Well, they're um, a very handy craft for teaching uh, juniors mm -hmm. how to handle uh, a small powerboat like that. Um, they have uh, weekend expeditions where they take juniors somewhere, and the juniors have a chance to uh, work at the engines and take the wheel. And they also have uh, day sea training ships where the boats are taken out to sea. And it generally gives the juniors a, a chance to um, give them instruction in the use of 
small boats, how to use small boats. Also, how to bring them alongside. Yes, and how to bring them alongside. And still more how count. to throw a line. <laughs> and how to throw a line. <laughs> now. Now, Paul, we seem to be on to what looks to me like a pulling race. Is that it? Yes, that's true. This is um, a race between six whalers. Um, there's four divisions in this. There are two from Anson Division, yes. two from Duncan Division, one from Hawk and one from Frobisher Divisions. And these took part in a recent regatta, I believe. Yes, um, we had the um, divisional races not so long ago, and these are the ones that qualified for the finals. Well, now, number five boat seems to be in yes, the lead. Yes, I believe that comes from Duncan Division. Uh-huh. And there's well, five Anson in the crew, one Cox. Yes. And they've not got more than about 30 yards to go, yes, I it looks say there like, a... It looks like Duncan are going to get this, and Just Anson about. might be second, who That's are on seven. the far side. Number seven, seven yes. Yeah. Well, now, let's go for it. That's it. That's the finish, and the winning boat was number five from Duncan Division, right? Oh. Uh, is that part of the drill too? Yes, that's that's the old tradition. They chuck the winning coxswain in in the drink. Doesn't seem to be a very nice way of rewarding the chap who got you there. Still, well, you still. see, I, I think the crew seems to think that the coxswain doesn't do any work, so they make him pay for it in the end. Uh -huh. That seems to be the general view. Uh -huh. Well, the wind's freshened up quite a lot, Paul, since we saw that uh, rigging sails on the foreshore. And now we've got a couple of cutters, I think. They are actually in, out in the river, haven't we? Yes, they are a couple of cutters, are not they? Do you go out in those yourself? Yes, um, a coxswain, you can qualify to become a coxswain, so you can take one of these boats out any time you want to, and then the coxswain makes up a crew of his own and takes them out for a sail in the afternoon. Um, the rig of this cutter is this flute rig, and uh, its actual length is 32 feet. Is it difficult to handle? No, I, it's quite uh, quite easy to handle and quite... Must be a lot of fun on a nice breezy afternoon like this, I think. Very nice picture they make. Well, I think that just about covers the waterfront down here at Ganges and all the numerous things that go to learning seamanship. But there's a very great deal more than that in learning how to be a sailor. So here are just a few impressions as we recorded on our film cameras. Well, Paul, what does it really feel like to be one of that lot, a new boy? Well, as you get disembarked from the bus, you're just beginning to feel pretty homesick. And especially when you walk in those gates, the place looks pretty bleak. You don't quite know what you're in for? No, and especially with the junior instructors and the POs there to meet you. So I expect their bark's worse than their bite, isn't it? Yeah. Now what happens, Joe? Well, um, you're all checked off on a list to make sure you're all there, and you're put in respective messes, which, uh, by the way, these are named after current ships, such as Bulwark and Daring. Narrow trousers and a lot of hair, and soon to lose both, I think. Oh, yes, they very soon lose their hair. It's got to be regulation length, and so... Quite a lot comes off on my first visit to the barbers. But after a while, you settle into the routine, and um, after a hard day's work, there's nothing better than to be able to have a shower bath. But one of the most bewildering things is collecting all your new kit. You're just marched into this building, and lined up against this counter, on which there's a massive pile of kit which you don't know what it's for, but you're just told to put it into your kit bag. Also, um, you're measured up for suits and you're match for colour because it looks much smarter if the whole suit is the same colour. Those white trousers look wide enough to jump through almost, don't they? Oh yes, they're a bit bewildering too at first, tripping over them. And now the parade ground. Yes, one of the first things you do when you join is learn the elementary drill. And with the instructor the right. on at you, you right. don't know what's what and who's who. But after a while you get it, it isn't too bad. That's a very welcome sound. You're glad to be able to go along to the Nuffit stand easy. 
and uh, have a soft drink, especially if the weather's hot. Well, that went down quick enough. 25% of the time at Ganges is spent in school, and uh, a lot of this time is spent in laboratories. What other subjects do you have to do? Oh, we also have to do quite a bit of navigation, naval history, geography, English. And these are the junior uh, uh, naval mechanics, aren't they? Air mechanics, rather. Going at the double, and of course, a pilot's life depends later on the certificates which these lads will sign. Um, we also have mechanics. Used uh, to be known as stokers? Yes, they used to be called stokers. And I hear they really love taking those engines apart and putting them together again. Yes, I believe they do. This is our life, it can be yours, is it? Not likely. This is um, radar. It's another branch in seamanship. And the final branch is gunnery. They're on a twin four-inch mounting here. The shells are pretty heavy and you have to catch them in a special way, otherwise you're likely to drop them on your foot, and if you did, you'd know all about it. I bet you would. We do quite a lot of PT, and uh, here you see juniors doing judo. We also do trampoline work. That almost looks fun. It is, rather. And um, this sort of thing builds you up quite an appetite. What's the food really like, Paul? Well, the variety isn't too bad, because at the midday meal we get about three choices. But the cooking isn't too good. But that isn't surprising, really, considering they've got to cook for 1,800 juniors. And also, they've got to get them through the dining hall in about half an hour. And now pay for it. Yes, that's a very welcome sight on a Wednesday. Second class juniors getting 10 shillings, first class juniors getting 15. And this, of course, is in the Nelson Hall, where you have all the yes, figureheads. Yes, we have several figureheads. That's one of the original Ganges, and also one of St. Vincent. And uh, in the finer points of seamanship, there's several ways to coil down a rope. It's being cheesed down there. And taught, we are taught several bends and hitches. One of the most important of these is the bowling. And being as your life might depend on this knot, you must know it thoroughly. And the best way to teach you is to tie it on your own body. That is the fancy knot called the Turk's Head. And then there's more marching. But by this time, it's only learning the finer points of drill. And it doesn't seem so bad. In fact, you can nearly enjoy it. But never quite. No, not quite. We have a divisional mar march pass once a week, with the commander taking the salute. Harking back to specialist branches for a moment, Paul, what's your own? My branch is communications. When we pass out at Ganges, we have to be able to receive Morse at 22 words a minute and also to be able to send it. We also do semaphore. That's me. I don't think I could have been very many weeks on course when I did that. And we also do typewriting. What's so that's that, receiving Morse yes, in your headphones? Yes, we receive and... Morse on, straight onto the typewriter. And there's also, we use the oldish flashing lamp. Well, Paul, on that piece of film, I think we saw just about all the signaling methods there are, both ancient and modern, including an oldest lamp. But now we're back on the jetty and looking at the signal tower up there. What's that signal tower actually used for? Well, uh, the signal tower is used to train juniors uh, in receiving flashing, and it's also used to send messages out to ships which might come into the harbour at any time. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an oldest at work up there now, I think. It looks as though it's pointing our way as well. How about you read, Papa? read that? India, Papa, Echo, Pipe, Delta, Oscar, Whiskey, November, Pipe, pipe Down. Sounds like somebody's trying to be rude to us. One of your friends out there, or maybe he's being rude to me. Yeah. Unfortunately, neither of us have got the chance of being rude back to him, but still. Well, let's not imagine that uh, it's all work and no play, to use the old cliché for young sailors here who are learning how to go out later on and join the fleet because there's plenty of play as well. So let's just see, on film, some of the things they do. Well, those are certainly splendid playing fields you've got at Ganges, Paul. Yes, we have got some very good playing fields, and uh, in the foreground you can see it's playing cricket. We have quite a lot of practice at this, so we have quite good Ganges teams. Also, we play what's called softball. 
It's not quite so skillful, but nevertheless it's fast and furious. And one of the cooler sports, of course, is water polo. In this match I actually played, we have uh, interleague matches. And uh, after match is finished, you know all about it. Pretty hard going. It is. One of our newer hobbies is archery. Not quite a bull, but never mind. No, they're not very skillful yet, but they'll improve. And uh, another hobby of ours is campcraft. Is a tent being rigged. It's uh, very useful. And uh, that's me doing a bit of cooking. My mother wouldn't believe it, though. Well, throwing the bangers. Yes, very enjoyable, that. You can always eat them afterwards. And uh, once a year we have what's called Parents' Day. And it's quite a sight to see all the parents rushing in the gates to meet their respective sons. And one of the main centres of interest as you first come in is the mast, of course. Family reunions. He's got a pretty sister. It's not his sister, actually. Well, good for him. As I say, the mast is um, very impressive. It's 142 foot high and it dominates the whole of the, of the whole of Ganges. We laid on several sideshows for these people. All the various branches laid on their own displays. And the um, first one here is the gunnery display. Here you see um, a bow for being loaded and fired as a demonstration. A torpedo and anti-submarine. They also laid on a demonstration in this of a ship being mined. Just as well that wasn't full size, I think. Yes, just as well. I wonder who was the more embarrassed. The big thing of the afternoon is when the juniors show off their prowess by doing various displays. <laughs> This is the Ganges bugle barn. Marching on in splendid style. Oh yes, they have plenty of training for it. And it means a little extra money too. And um, we also had a royal guard, and it was almost the same guard that took part in the Queen's birthday review. Um, we had the, one of the main displays was PT. The muscular PTI you can see there, he used to be Mr. Hong Kong once, now he's just Mr. Ganges. The vaults um, aren't too difficult because we have quite a lot of PT in vaulting, but nevertheless they look quite impressive. Do indeed. Then the big thing of the afternoon. After they've cleared their own After they've cleared away. their own trappings away, that's the green rub of it. Is. But the big thing is the mass manning ceremony. You can see them marching on here with the side party, or with the bosun pipes, for this ceremony. And the mass bands there, those are the Royal Marines and the Bugle Band combined, with also the Royal Guard. The same parade ground all right, but there are no mothers present today. And the moment we're to see the mass there, manned by the 82 boys who perform this feat, and that's the right word for it too, at the drop of a hat, or perhaps more accurately, the piping shrill of a bosun's call. But first, let's meet Ganges' captain, Captain Mackenzie. Now, if any of you are at all familiar with the exploits of Her Majesty's submarine Thrasher during the last war, well, you're looking at the distinguished skipper of that submarine. How do you find it, sir, after commanding a submarine with a crew of, what, 50-odd, and coming to Ganges with well, 1,200 boys and a great many instructors. Well, it's a totally different job, of course. I've never had any experience with a training service before, which I regret because I simply cannot imagine a finer job than this, mm. and being in command of such a very great establishment. In other words, you've taken to it quite easily, have you? Well, it took me the whole of the first term anyway to get used to and find out all that was going on, but I love it now, absolutely. Some people might say that uh, a lot of tradition is disappearing in this modern day and age. How are you able to maintain the great deal of tradition there is in the Royal Navy with these young boys of 15? Well, Ganges is steeped in tradition. We've been training boys here for over 50 years. And tradition, of course, does play a tremendous part in that. And I'm quite certain that any boy who joins here 
By the time he's done two months in the establishment, he is extremely proud of being here and all it means and his uniform and the fact that he's joined the Navy. Well, that's her answer. Now, if you were asked to sum up in a sentence the purpose of the training here, what would you say? That's a pretty tall order to put it in a sentence, but uh, I should say that it is to fit a boy in one year so that he can take his place in the fleet when he leaves here ready to carry out all the responsibilities and duties which any sailor may be expected to do at any time. Well, thank you very much, sir. I expect you things to do, so we well, must keep you. I have quite a lot, certainly, but could I first of all introduce my commander, who is really the key to the whole establishment here? Indeed, sir. Yes, be delighted. Commander, commander Trick, Trick, I believe. Commander Trick. You know the boy of this establishment, aren't you, sir? Yes, I am. Well, perhaps before I have a word with you, I could have a, a brief uh, word with uh, the button boy. Could I do that? Yes, indeed. Now, your junior radio operator, Cliff, isn't it? Button boy. Now, what exactly is the button boy? Well, I'm the chap who stands on the top and fans there. Chap who stands on the top? Sir. Quite a long way up, too, isn't it? 142 feet, sir. 142 feet. Sir. Well, we shall be seeing you doing, do that in a moment. How big is it up there? Can you show me? About that big. And you stand on that? Sir. How do you stand upright? Have you got anything to support you, or...? Well, there's a lightning conductor on the button and it curves around like that and there's a big knob there you just lean your knees against like that that's all there is to it sir you ever look down yes sir you do look down sir from that height sir goodness me well better you than me i think perhaps you'd better go and get on with it don't you sir, sir. thank you very much thank you sir. right commander well if we're ready perhaps things could get underway <clears throat> yes certainly now that's the person's call we were talking about. Now that, that's the person's call and that's the piping party and in fact what they're piping is way aloft. And up they go in time to the music. And up they go in time to the music. Past what looks like a safety net is it? Yes that is indeed a safety net and uh, fortunately we haven't had any need to use it. Uh, good thing too. Very good thing indeed. Of course they're going up now in slow time but as you can well imagine in the old days, in the case of an emergency, uh, the order was given to well off. You say in the old days, what was the origin of the ceremony then? Oh, well, in the origin, really, goes back to the very early days of sail. And this ceremony of manning the mast was part of the, the whole ceremony of manning ship. And ships were manned when they were inspected or visited by admirals, flag officers, or indeed when um, the fleet perhaps was visited at its anchorage uh, by royalty. Now, where are they getting to now, the leaders there? Well, now they're just approaching what we call the futtock shrouds, and they're just going past the devil's elbow, which is perhaps the most difficult part when you're climbing this path. Some come through the hole, which I believe is called the lover's hole. Yes, right? that's called the lover's hole, and of course that's the easy way up. And <laughs> no real... Well, you call it easy, still. <laughs> no real sailor dares go through the lover's hole. Are all boys in the establishment capable of doing this? There are 82 there, but that's a long yes. way from being the whole compliment. Yes, indeed. Um, all boys, when they join Ganges, have to go up over the mast. It's, uh, it's quite a challenge to the boy joining HMS Ganges. Indeed, I should think it was. But once he's, uh, once he's achieved it, uh, he never looks back and he's never, never worried about going up there anymore. Do you have any lack of volunteers? No lack of volunteers. Not even for Button Boy? Not even for Button Boy. Good luck. Now they're getting to what? Now you can see the Button Boy is going up what we call the Jacob's Ladder. And what's the yard beneath him in that sort of half moon? Uh, that's the Tagallant yard or upper yard. And, uh, and he's now the button boy's getting to what? Now he's getting to the trestle tree, the Tagallant trestle tree. And he's a long way from the ground. And he's a long way from the ground. And that last, that last bit of the climb is not easy. And up the bare pole. Up the bare pole. And if it's wet, if it's been raining, or if we were at sea, if it was. Uh, salty, then it's not easy to get Then up. you had to do it, but of course here, obviously, in bad weather, this wouldn't happen, would it? In bad weather, uh, normally it wouldn't happen. Now, up he goes onto his butt. Now he goes onto his butt, yes. And he says he can look down quite happily. What a boy. Yes. 
Yes, it's quite high. The ordinary uh, classes, when they come up and they, they do their training, uh, going over the mast, they're not required to go higher than the uh, half moon there. But uh, all boys, if they wish, and during their recreational periods, can go up to the bottom. And in fact, quite a number do, of course. Just rather waiting for that explosion to <laughs> ask you what the significance of that was. That is, in fact, the sunset gun and is fired in the flagship to denote sunset. And that is when all the ensigns are lowered for the day. And the bottom boy comes to the salute. The bottom boy comes to the salute. And I suggest we just watch and listen to this splendid sunset ceremony. Yes. in towards the towards the mark. Ah, there they go. Yes. The next pipe will be piped down from aloft and then you'll see them coming down the rigging. Not down the way they went up, but down their nearest. No, they'll come down the stays and all come down at top speed. How long does it take to clear the mast? I think it takes uh, about 12 to 14 seconds. You see, some of them come down very quickly. Uh, they're inclined to sort of slide down, but if they do that sort of thing, they can burn their hands. In yes, fact, indeed. some of the more enthusiastic boys who like to get down very quickly do burn their hands. But it's very difficult to stop them because they're so keen on this particular ceremony. <laughs> Now, I believe the next part of the ceremony is the button boy coming forward to receive his silver crown from the captain. Isn't it? Yes, uh, that's correct. You'll see him doubling forward to a minute. Uh, in a minute, he comes up before the captain, and the captain gives him his reward, which is here he comes. And this is an appropriate finale for a very impressive ceremony, I'm sure you'll agree, as button boy Cliff receives his silver crown from Ganges' captain. And surely we must also pay tribute, not only to him, but to the other 1,200 boys of HMS Ganges, who in the expert guiding hands of the captain and instructional staff are learning in modern fashion the ancient and traditional craft of being sailors under the white ensign. 